really excited for this episode, both to share this with you, but also for personal reasons. Gabby Bernstein, I'm sure you've heard of her. She's a New York Times bestselling author of eight books. She's also a celebrated motivational speaker and host of the podcast, Dear Gabby. She describes her work as being intended to help you crack open to a spiritual relationship of your own understanding so that you can live in alignment with your true purpose. In her latest book, Happy Days, Gabby is getting into her newest level of ascension, of healing, of revelation that happened as she recovered new traumatic memories and went through some really difficult and trying times that broke her open, her own form of what, you know, I like to call is an AFGE, another freaking growth experience after another. And she's taking us along on her journey of healing, sharing the resources and the lessons she's learned along the way. It's probably her most personal book yet. So in this interview, we're getting into some of that, but also We're getting into something specific about my relationship with Gabby and something that happened between the two of us several years ago that she actually writes about in her book. And as I read it, a new level of healing happened for me as well. So we're going to be getting into that and lots more this episode of The Language of Love. Gabby Bernstein, I am so excited to talk to you. I'm just really happy to connect with you. And these podcast interviews are like these selfish moments for me to reconnect with old friends. And so I'm going to take full advantage of that right now in the service of your community, but also in the service of myself connecting to you. Oh, that's yeah. It's funny because I love that too. I mean, everyone I talk to in my podcast is someone that I want to have a conversation with or that I miss or that I want to connect to. But we also have to figure out how to do that not around work. (laughs) I agree. I think that's really wise. It's really, really wise. (laughs) And we're going to get to that. But your newest book is what I really want to focus on in this conversation. It's called Happy Days, The Guided Path from Trauma to Profound Freedom and Inner Peace. And I can't say I've read every one of your eight books, but I've read several of them, obviously, including this one. And I have to say, This was by far my favorite, Mm -hmm. not only because obviously I intimately know trauma and pain and suffering, but also, and the lessons and the freedom that can be found there, but also to me, not that you aren't always authentic and you strive for authenticity, but this was the most, I don't, you know, I don't want to say this because it infers that you haven't been in the past, but it was the most honest and raw I've ever seen you publicly. Well, it's of course is because this is the book that I wrote on the other side. Yeah. So every book I'd written up to this point was a book that I'd written either in a state of dissociation from trauma, just living without knowing what happened to me, or in a place of recovery, deep recovery. And this book, while I'm no, while I'm still always working my healing and my recovery. I wouldn't have been able to write this book if I wasn't on the other side of the frozen state of dissociation and trauma response. Yeah. And repression. Repression. Yeah. Because this, the journey that led to this book really started when you recover, you talk about how living a spiritual life, which is what all of your work in the world is about, right? Living a spiritual life isn't about moving past pain and suffering, but moving through it. That's what I'm always saying to you. You cannot go over. I mean, we do, we spend our lives going around under (laughs) detouring where the pain is. Right. But the true healing and the true freedom comes when you're willing to move through it. And you became brave enough, you say, because it is, it's true. It requires bravery to face Mm -hmm. the deeper reasons, you know, so many of your books and the journey, you've talked a great deal about your, your recovery from substance abuse for many years now, that's really when your career as a motivational speaker and healer and author began is when you reached and began that true recovery, which you've been in for many years now, right? Like 15 years or more? 17 and a half 17 years. and a half. That's amazing. I know I'm a I'm half of almost half my life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, less than half my life, but almost there. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. And we'll continue, especially with the amazing work you're doing. But, and we're going to get into sort of the new levels of trauma that were revealed to you that not only explained what was underneath your addiction, right? Because addiction is always us running from something or running to something else, but trying to escape the pain, right? But I just want to, the thing that I found really fascinating, and we'll, and we'll get into what you were avoiding in a minute, but the thing that I found fascinating, you talk about this in the beginning of the book, especially as someone who has worked with you and knows you sort of personally, is how you share about how the onstage Gabby, right, really could show up authentically and raw and vulnerable when you were on stage, right? But in your personal life, that was where the defenses came up and the Mm. repression came up. And I was just wondering, there was this really beautiful moment that I was wondering if you could share that you talk about in the book. To me, it was really beautiful, even though I know it was also really painful, where you were giving a talk somewhere and your husband was in the audience yeah. And he was feeling the connection that came with your authentic vulnerability. And then you got off stage. Can you share that story? Yeah, I got off stage and it was gone. I got off stage and I was no longer in the room, as he would say. Yeah, It's funny that that's the story that you pulled out because it's the same story Gabor Mate refers to when he was on my podcast, but also just in conversations with me. And it's probably the most clear story of what, it looks like to have places in your life where you can be in the full expression of who you are and then places in your life where it doesn't feel, where it feels too vulnerable. Yeah. And my ability to be vulnerable on stage, I've come to learn at that time, that type of vulnerability on stage came from the fact that I controlled that stage. I could dictate the energy in that room. I was telling the story. I was the conductor. And when I got off, that was no longer the case. And also just the nature of trauma that that intimate connection sometimes is often the scariest connection. Mm -hmm. And then of course, all that goes on with a partner or a friend or an intimate relationship, when they don't understand why you are the way you are in one way and why you are the way you are in another way. And so really as a result of living my recovery, I can, my husband will be like, really for the first time, even recently, after a lot of recovery and a lot of commitment, And a big conversation with Gabor Mate where he really helped me hone in on the ways that I was still even now not in that authentic truth. That recent quantum shift I've had, I've had this experience of being in the room with my husband and him saying, you're finally in the room with me. That makes me want to cry. That's, that is everything. It is. And it is, it is astounding to me still how many of us, millions, the majority of us in so many ways in our most intimate relationships aren't fully in the room. And you use this term, as do I, of big T trauma and little T trauma, right? That we all, every single one of us has trauma. Some of us have some big T trauma, which means like serious abuse, physical, emotional sexual, major illness, major financial, like crisis, whatever, homelessness, huge, big T traumas. But then there are a million little T traumas, right? Of bullying or rejection or humiliation. And that those find a home in our body, just like with you and your journey. For me, with my trauma, once you break open like that, you're open to all of these newer, out of desperation, right? Which is the mother of invention. We become open to coming back to our bodies, right? So you share your, some of your little T traumas, but the big T ones you get into and you so poignantly share that moment where you began to recover memories of sexual abuse and then through postpartum depression, right? So like, to me, those were the two, you tell me, but to me, as I was reading, those were the two big catalysts of what launched you into out of the, what I call AFGEs, these big whoppers of another growth, fucking growth experience. These things that break us open. AFGEs. Yeah. I had a lot of AFGEs in my life. (laughs) Me too. But yeah, I think that the remembering the trauma was probably the biggest AFGE of my lifetime and hopefully will remain that way. And then Yeah, I did a bunch of, I did years of trauma recovery. Then part of that, I think, is the catalyst for me actually being able to be a container through which I could hold a pregnancy. 
because mm-hmm. my energy field, my my somatic experience was settled and I wasn't so stuck and frozen and I wasn't living in hypervigilance. And so I had created an environment where I could not only conceive, but, and I didn't conceive naturally, I did IUI, but the second IUI it stuck and I was able to make a healthy embryo and had a son. Yeah. And I gave birth to my son and it was a beautiful experience, but, and not, but yes, there's a big, but there's a huge, but it's an AFGE. I was hit with postpartum depression and I spent about four months denying that and trying to woo my way out of it, <laughs> trying to, you know, acupuncture, homeopathy, because yeah. I was brought up homeopathic. So that's what I knew is you don't get a prescription and I'd never had one before. And that wellness mentality, that kind of like trendy wellness world mentality fucked me up mm-hmm. and it almost took my life. And so I think that there's a lot of greatness in the natural. I mean, listen, I have all my natural remedies. I've got a cold right now. I'm doing it all right. But there is a time and place for modern medicine and God works through that medication. Yeah, I thought that was so powerful, that discussion you have in the book about not only getting on medication for postpartum depression, but also and to be very specific and antidepressant and antidepressant, yeah, and antidepressant mm-hmm. and, but also feeling shame and embarrassment in your community that you couldn't just solve it through all these other ways. I remember being at an event with a lot of my fellow authors that were published by the same publishing company. And I was looking at a girlfriend. I was like, oh, I just got this prescription. I'm supposed to be doing this. Like, do you think I should so- go talk to so-and-so about this? And she was like, definitely don't fucking talk to that person about it. And then I was like, do you think I should talk to so-and-so? And these are like world-renowned, you know, yeah. doctors. And she was like, absolutely not. She's like, they're going to shame the shit out of you. And I was like, oh my God, this is oh. the worst women. This is why it took me so long to get here. And so my PSA for all women is if you are not feeling in your right mind, go to a gynecologist, a psychiatrist, a therapist, whatever you have access to, the motherhood center, get help. Yeah. Get help. Yeah. And that really changed things for you because it puts you in a position where you could do the healing work. That's exactly right. So the thing that really helped me make the commitment to the meds was my psychiatrist said to me, this medication will help you feel safe enough in your system so that you could do deeper therapeutic work. And she was exactly right the safety that I now had in my mind and body and the hypervigilance was gone. And so then I could actually get down, peel back the layers of that onion further and further. And in my therapy, I practice internal family systems therapy, which I'm now since trained in. Mm -hmm. And it's really based on the premise that we have all these different parts of who we are that are protecting us from very young child parts. And those young child parts are so far from reach. They're terrifying to check in with. They're terrifying to even contemplate. And my ability to feel safe enough in my body allowed me to go so much deeper into my therapy, connect to that child part, allow all those protection mechanisms to settle enough so that I could get closer to those child parts, the traumatized little girl, to bring her to safety, to let her know that I'm here for her, to let her know she's not alone to know she has a place in my home. She is safe. She is with me right now. Like this is stuff that you hear people talk about, you know, from a therapeutic lens. And of course you've done this for years, Mm -hmm. but it is real when you have the courage and the system that can hold that and not be in such a fierce protection mechanism blocking you from it. And so the combination of the therapy and the EMDR and the, all of the work that I did, I was able, I have been able to continuously establish what's known as a self to part connection. And so the part's the little girl, it's a part of me and self is my internal parent. It's the leader inside of me. And you and I both, and most of us <laughs> did not have the best. They were great people. They were, everyone's doing the best we c- they can, but our parents in each of their different ways, mine and yours, we're not emotionally attuned, mature, healthy enough to give us the safety that we needed and wanted. And so Mm -hmm. it really is a process and you, and you describe it so beautifully and all the strategies you used of reparenting yourself, but also recognizing not only those little girl parts, but also the parts that kept those little parts exiled or hidden. Right. And so one of the key triggers that I wanted to get into that you really 
beautifully address is the biggest one. And by the way, from a quantum love perspective is the lowest frequency state we can hold is that key trigger of shame. And you talk about, I think I wrote down a quote, if you can discover where shame may be hiding, then you have the opportunity to face it and move past it rather than unconsciously letting it rule your life. So I want to get into something personal with you, if you're willing, about you and me. Well, that's our chapter. You're in that chapter. I saw, (laughs) 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 which is what I want to talk about. Okay, cool. Let's do it. Because what was so profound in me, to me, the profound reaction in me when reading that chapter is that you described what was getting triggered in you and this experience we had that I kind of understood at the time, but didn't fully understood. And what happened is that your, you and your trigger, and you described that, you know, I think this was the part I met the knives out persona, right? Mm. Shows up anytime someone spoke to you in a judgmental tone, or you felt judged. Like we all have these parts that ideally in parts work or in internal family systems, you kind of name these parts, right? So you were describing how there's this one part of the protector that protects those parts of ourselves that we don't want to see for you. There was this knives out persona, but you describe in your, as you're describing this event, that as I sat in the audience filled with other students, I realized how much I still had to learn. I came face to face with the core reason I was running that impermissible, uncomfortable feeling I'd worked so hard to avoid the most terrifying emotion of all shame. So much of my suffering came from the ways I ran from the deepest feeling, the core wound of shame. And so what I remember is that when you and I first met in person, a mutual friend of ours, Colette Baron reed put us in touch because she and I and another teacher were going to be doing this workshop at, where was it? Was it at Omega? At Omega. Kripalu. Kripalu. Kripalu, excuse me, at Kripalu called sexual healing, about healing from sexual trauma and abuse. And then Colette called me up as like, Gabby is a friend of mine and she's just recently recovered these memories. Would you be willing to talk to her? She wants to participate in this workshop. I was like, absolutely. And I remember you had like, literally, it's probably like a week. It was like weeks in. Yeah. Yeah. And we had this big conversation about it and you were already on your way of finding all these resources. And maybe I gave you some others. And we spoke for a moment about this workshop that was a year out, right? Mm -hmm. And then the workshop comes and you and this other teacher spoke in the morning. And that is when I guess your shame. And I remember, cause I think I might've even been your partner mm-hmm. during this exercise, mm-hmm. but I remember like you left the building energetically mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then you came back that afternoon for your session. And you said to me, Oh, I've been on my crystal mat. I've been doing mm-hmm. everything. Like I am super mm-hmm. triggered. Right. Mm-hmm. And then Mm -hmm. you got through the event and then you called me that night and you were really upset because some people who had come to see you because all the attendees came either see me or this other teacher or you or all three of us together. Right. Like we all were pulling people. But a lot of them obviously came because they knew you and someone had come up to you and complained that it wasn't kumbaya. It was like too serious or too triggering. Do you remember this? Of course. And you were really upset. And then you said, okay, maybe I'm just getting triggered. And I said, look, don't get triggered. It's fine. I'm going to bring, you know, I'll lighten it up tomorrow. It'll be my turn. I'll bring it home. Everyone will feel good about it. Which you did, then, which you really did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I did a good job. I'm just telling you what I remember. You tell me yeah. if I'm remembering this incorrectly. Yeah. All right. So then we all go home. And then a few days later, I'm getting ready to record my radio show. And I remember this because it really traumatized me. And I'll tell you. Oh, why. no. Did Knives Out come to you? Knives Out. Yeah, not, I got Knives Out. Yeah. So I'm doing the radio show. And just that morning, I had seen someone tag us who had been at this workshop and had been on stage. You and I sat on stage with her while the other teacher was doing this mm. deep, intensive healing that was not at all surface. and that healing around shame that kind of triggered you, right? This woman who had sat in between us and been worked with in front of the whole audience had posted on social media how profound and healing and beautiful the it was for her. 
But while I was on my radio show, there are all these calls coming, like these frantic calls coming through from you where you were really upset. And I realized after I get off the radio, I'm like, oh, I go and look. And someone had written who wasn't even at our event, but she was the roommate of this woman who was Mm. on stage with us. She was there for another purpose, but she wrote like a nasty letter to Kripalu that specifically mentioned you. Right. So she, it was about all of it. But she was like, I got triggered because my roommate had been through this sexual abuse thing. And Gabby's supposed to uplift us. And I'm never going to another Gabby Bernstein event. And you were really upset. And I think this woman from the organization was also part of it because she had gotten the email. And so here's my hundred percent. Here's my insensitive self. OK, that triggered you. And I could have done this differently. But I'm like, I get triggered by you getting triggered. Right. And so I said, look, it's fine. Here's this woman who was at the event. Like, I just kind of like brushed you off. And I said, look, this woman said it was fine. This other woman wasn't even at the event. Don't make a big deal of it. And I said, don't get triggered. Mm. And you wrote me back in all caps. I am not triggered. And you never spoke to me again for Mm. um, you never responded to it. I sent you so many texts. I sent you so many emails. I called you you mm-hmm. iced me completely. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. and I was like, what the fuck is going on? And mm-hmm. then every time I would see mutual friends of ours at the next event or somewhere mm-hmm. else, they would say to me, what happened with you and Gabby? Like, what happened at this event? And I kept trying to reach out to you. And honestly, I partly thank Sammy for helping to facilitate this. But after Sammy died, you reached out to me and with your beautiful heart. And maybe you don't even remember not having responded to me, but that was like four or five years later Hmm. after you completely, and I never understood it. And I, it was a protector part. So I was in my shame and the, what the young woman said was completely accurate. I mean, I'm only going to speak for myself from the three of us that were in that room. Yeah. I can't speak for anybody else, but But I did say before the event began, like we shouldn't label it. Well, you know, it was a weird mix already from the start, right? But what I saying that it's about trauma and all that, they didn't want us to because we called it something different. And that was a real mistake. We called it like, you know, awaken your goddess or whatever it was. And it was turned into a whole sexual trauma retreat. And so I flagged that in the beginning. It was, we did listen to the venue and when hot yeah we didn't want to call it something else but we let and we did not give people what we told them we were promoting yeah and i had no business speaking on that topic at that time no business way too soon way too soon i was worried about that but you were yeah. yeah no it's only it's my responsibility and so that was like the one time in my life where i actually overstepped what i would want any teacher to do which is don't teach from a place that's broken And so that was really triggering for me. And so the young woman's words were really real. She was right. She was very inappropriate, a lot of what happened there. And I'm only speaking for myself. And my reaction to you is just my trauma response. It's like, you know, if we feel shame, we want to project that shame onto somebody else. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's one of the core shame responses. And it's a big one for me, defense and redirect. And I'm sorry that you experienced that. I'm so happy <laughs> I had to, to come work. clean with you. About, well, it's so it was, nice that we could do it here, you know, I to know. people feel the repair of that. And yeah. the beautiful truth is that when I found out about your son, I didn't remember that. In, like, I, I knew that we had some weird energy because that thing wasn't a good event for me and I had shame around it, but I didn't feel any disconnect from you. Mm-hmm. And I felt just the most, the strongest desire to hold you and just to be with you and to connect to you in any way it could. And I do feel that. And and so, but yeah, I mean, that's a beautiful example of a shame response, right? So it's, we're in that, we're in that impermissible feeling and we do not want to face it. And it's coming up in our face over and over again. And so what are we going to do to say, fuck you to somebody else, right? Yeah. And I, my shadow or my part, one of my parts is the one that gets abandoned or shamed or rejected Mm. and it was somehow bad or wrong, or it's their fault, my fault that that happened or those things happened to me. So when you did that, even though I knew intellectually and I could see that really this had nothing to do with me, the icing out was 
triggered my trauma. That's your, that's yours. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I was, so it was very healing for me, even though I kind of knew that that's what happened. It was very healing for me to read that part because I could come back. Understand it. Yeah. I could understand it. And that part of me that was personalizing it. And it was such a big event in my life, Laura, (laughs) that it entered into my biggest book, right? Into the most vulnerable book. There we are. The whole chapter on shame was wrapped around this experience that you were the victim of. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, isn't that interesting how it all comes full circle? And I'm just, you know, I just want to thank you for welcoming me back into your life and for holding that space for me now in this way. Well, you are always welcome and you always will be. And I love the ways in which you describe you've reparented yourself, you've healed yourself. I know you only have a limited amount of time. I could ask you a million questions about it, but you guys, if you read the book, I'll come back. I'll come back to the show. This is our last. Good. Now that we're talking again, you'll come. (laughs) Will you answer my text? Well, you know what's so funny is I, (laughs) you know, even in the exchanges with my my assistant, there was like a lot of like slow response, and I just like now I understand your your part, your protective part. I'm like, oh God, like even my assistant was activated. I was so (laughs) proud that I texted you about it because oh yeah. Yeah, that felt the traumatized so part of me would be like, well, fuck her. She just doesn't want to come on, you know, or whatever else. But I was like, no, let me check it out. There is and, I, and the funny here. thing is, is I really, really wanted to come on. Yeah. And so that's an important message for your listeners is that we have these protector parts that are going to tell us a story that's really different than often than what the real story is. Yeah. And then also that ability to be able to recognize that your protection mechanisms are actually triggered by somebody else's protection mm-hmm. mechanisms. And when we start to see people through the lens of their parts, we don't feel like we're always the one that's wrong. Yeah. And we it's don't not take personal. On, it's not personal. Yeah. Yeah, that's so profound. You guys read the book. And also there's so many resources on your website for healers and the different healing modalities and meditations at GabbyBernstein.com. The book is called Happy Days, The Guided Path from Trauma to Profound Freedom and Inner Peace. And that is my greatest wish. I know you've, you've arrived at the land of freedom and inner peace. May you live there, make deep roots, discover even deeper levels of it and live the beautiful life that you so deserve. I'm really excited. Right back at you. Thank you. Right back at you. I love you. Thank you. I love you too, Gabby. 